and this is, you know, one of the things that, you know, I alluded to before where you're, you're seeking out new venues and then you're, you're seeking out new ideas. And I, I suppose the, the idea of putting on loads and loads of bands in Edinburgh, is some, uh, Hogmanay is something that we, we take for granted now. I mean, you, you basically wait at a certain time of year, you get told who's going to be headlining, who's going to be on. And it's pretty much part of a, an Edinburgh Hogmanay, but, you know, I'm old enough to remember where everyone just got bevied and um, snogged each other on the Tron. And um, once they'd done that, maybe it went around hitting each other. I mean, um, how did you come upon that idea? I mean, was it something that oh, yeah. you figured that um, it was we're, Edinburgh needed We're back that? in Glasgow again. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we had our first New Year parties uh, in 1990 in Glasgow, the beginning and, then, and the end of the year. Um, and we continued them for a couple of years in Glasgow. But in the meantime, we were trying to persuade Edinburgh to go along with a, a, a similar idea. I mean, we never really thought we'd be allowed to close Prince Street for a party. Um, uh, but it's become an institution and, uh, a, 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 and a part of the establishment and brings in tens of millions of pounds to the city. Um, so we're delighted that it goes on. Um, but it, it, it it's every year is logistically needs to be reshuffled because every year something new comes up, something has changed. And what is that in terms of health and safety legislation? Yeah, particular? sometimes not just legislation. Sometimes it's just reactions by the police against what happened the previous year. But we have much lower uh, injury rates than any other festival, any other festival in Britain. Uh, Eighty to hundred thousand people there. Uh, last year, less than 100 people treated and less than 20 people uh, going to hospital. Um, yeah. And I mean, when you're, um, when you're doing that, I mean, you, are you actually involved with who's playing as well? I mean, do you, what's the dynamic in terms of choosing the, choosing uh, the acts that you have for yeah. it? Well, um, you know, I, uh, I, we, now have, we now have a booker, but he has to put everything, everything past him. Past us, uh, sure is, but uh, uh, does the booking for us uh, for that. But uh, there's very much a, uh, a debate and a committee within within the, the the office as to who we want to have and who we can get. But it's not that easy. Um, not many people want to work on New Year's night, um, so we make a point of of putting lots of Scottish acts in because it's easier for them, and also it's appropriate. Uh, and this is something that interests me as well, because I know that people, uh, some record companies, they, they have a rule of only working um, acts that they like. And I mean, musically, not necessarily as people, but do you, would you say that in the early years, you're, you're mainly booking bands that you, you really liked and you really wanted to develop? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were driven by by our passion for the music, not for not for money, and I'd like to think that's still the same. Some people are playing to win, some people, but we were playing to survive. I think it's a different perspective on the world, and it's certainly a different perspective on uh, on what Live Nation or AAG represent. Now, that's something that I think is is it worth covering as well. I mean, one of the things that we were discussing earlier on is the fact that you know there aren't that many people that are really putting on at the age, you know, how old were you when you put on your first stadium show in your, your 30s or uh, something? Yeah, uh, yeah, I was quite old really, yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's the thing, I mean, or 20s even, I mean, the, the idea of selling um, selling out these uh, these weekly nights, I mean, that by today's standards is a real measure of success. And I'm um, quite interested in whether you can see that happening now, because one of the complaints I get from young promoters is that They'll, they'll build up an act, they'll take the risk, the act will start to take off, and then when it gets to a certain level, you know, a big, a big company will come in and they'll go, right, okay, if you, don't, if you don't give us that band, you don't give us that gig, we're not gonna have your, we're not gonna have your big band playing at our festival. So there's, there's a kind of sense of, um, you know, there's a sense of blackmail there, really. And, you know, that puts a lot of people off because in the end they're like, well, why do I bother? As soon as, you know, this artist gets a point to make me money. But that consolidation uh, has been going on since 1995 um, uh, or, or thereabouts, uh, SFX and so on, before they became Live Nation and before they gobbled up Ticketmaster and, and blah, blah, blah. 
but I think they should, everyone should have a look at their accounts before they get too worried. Uh, there's, a, there's almost as big a deck of cards here as there's with the banks. Live Nations, I think, currently 1.9 billion in debt um, and is losing 250 million a year on, on current trading. Uh, and AEG is similarly uh, mortgaged up to the hilt. Uh, the, these people are trying to create an oligopoly where they are the price fixers and deny access to uh, any of the bans out there uh, to, to other people. Um, but there will always be agents who, agents, agents also get squeezed if there's no market, if there's only a couple of people to sell to. So if you've got, uh, if you've got good ears, uh, then you should try and make alliances with agents. Maybe there's, sp maybe there's space for a new generation of agents, a new generation of, of promoters, and, a, uh, and a, a new generation of bands all working together, as happened in the punk peak era. But it probably has to wait for, there's some, for there to be some wave of music, so a, a strong cultural wave to allow that to happen. Um, but it is true that the, do the dominance of, of the festival uh, circuit around Europe uh, is a difficulty, I think, because there's uh, okay if you if you're, you're the 180th band playing on that weekend's bill, is anyone going to see you or notice who you are anyway? It's better, I think, to have your your own your own gigs, and I think that uh, there's still there's always space at the bottom of, of a market and the top of the market, and so I would hope that somebody out there is brave enough to start again. There's certainly it's time for a new generation of people to do it. I think it's interesting what you're saying about the, the development of Scottish talent and the fact that you know, there were in the past, there were the bands that you don't knew would pull a crowd, but that's because you were also able to work with those bands. And I mean, do you think that the, that environment still exists? Well, we had a Hadrian's Wall policy of we weren't going into England, but if anything came over the, over the border and we liked it, then we wanted to, to, to work with them. But it also, since we had to fill up all the other dates that we were trying to fill up, also mean we had space to, to nurture uh, Scottish bands as well. And I think in the early 80s, um, that made a big difference to a whole range of bands from Edinburgh, Glasgow and elsewhere. Uh, that there was a, a home-bred home for them to come to, a promoter that cared about their music and cared about them. Um, and even unfashionable bands like, like Runrig have made me many thousands of pounds over the year and, and paid a few bills, whereas other bands that you think, wow, well, that's great to put on, have lost me millions, you know. And I mean, how does that, how do you keep going? You know, if you, if you got, you know, obviously there's the, the first open air festival you did in, in what was it, 1979, then there was the uh, gig on the green in the, the 90s. I mean, when that happens, I mean, does it, do you just like dust yourself down and go, right, okay, I better uh, go off yeah, to the next yeah, thing? Yeah, well, it still goes on. I mean, on, uh, on average, since I began, there's been one, there's been one day in the year when we've lost a hundred grand. Um, that sounds like I've lots of money. I mean, it, it does add up to about three million quid that has been lost over the years. But we've managed to make enough money and the rest of it to, to keep things ticking over. And so we're still here. Uh, gig in the Green over the three years lost 1.2 million. Uh, a little gig in the Highlands we, we, we put on uh, recently uh, lost 300,000. So it still goes on. Uh, you just have to have enough bottom to, to keep going uh, and work out and not take chances beyond what you can survive. And I mean, you, if someone is a young promoter now and they, you know, they, they lose a month's rent on, on, a, on a band or on a night, um, you know, they're thinking twice about doing, a, doing another show shortly afterwards, but you know, sure. that's probably going to mean they're going to end up sort of losing their, losing their flat or something. I mean, yeah. what's, uh, what did you go through all of that? Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, live, you know, waking up on Tuesday morning with nothing to live on till the end of the week and whatever. Um, uh, absolutely penniless. Uh, but the whole thing is, is up from the bootstraps. It's, it, it was not, none of it was borrowed money from banks except they gave us the time to pay off the big losses, but... Uh, uh, 
And do you, th- um, I mean, what kind of kept you going? Was it just this passion for the music? Would you just be like, oh, fuck, I've had enough. And then you'd hear a band and go, ah, oh, man, but I wouldn't mind putting them on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and were there any bands that you particularly got on with? Or, you know, I mean, this idea of, you know, did they recognize what you were doing? I mean, the, the risks that you were taking I think that's back one, of the, one of the things that's, that's missing, uh, for me anyway, nowadays, in that I'm doing more and more logistics, but um, there were periods in the 80s where all the bands and the agents, we were friends. And so, I mean, a couple of stories. One, I can remember flying out to uh, Madrid to see REM uh, because their management wanted us to persuade them that they should go to playing a stadium. And uh, so the band needed the promoters to tell them that they were big enough to go to a stadium because they didn't think they were. Funnily enough, um, it was a bad idea. They sold out, but they pared down the production so much that it didn't project at stadium level. And they've, they've avoided doing it ever since. You um, two, on the other hand, we, uh, one year we got f- we flew out to Boston. It was on St. Patrick's Day. And the river was green, and uh, they were playing the Boston Celtics uh, indoor stadium. Going backstage, and there's Neil Young, and there's the band. And, and they've got an idea that they want to turn a stadium into a nightclub, and um, they want all their promoters to get enthused by it, and talking with the production men and ourselves as to how to create the pop art tour, or, or how to create, it was actually, the, uh, yeah, uh, so you know those sort of memories of of of, uh, of real f- friendships with bands. It's what I think you you can do yourself if you start with a band from the bottom and they stay with you and you stay with them. Have there been any sort of disappointments? I mean, the, I was thinking perhaps something like the Red Hot Chili Peppers, who I remember seeing in what 1988 or something, which you put on, and then you know over the years you promoted them. Suddenly they're doing a stadium, but you know it's a co-promotion. But really, you're like, well, how come it's not actually a, a regular gig? I mean, do you, is that the point where, you know, just big business takes over and those sort of um, things are broken? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess we didn't choose to um, sell ourselves to the, the big boys and uh, we have to take the consequences for that. But I'd rather stand on my own feet than uh, be answering to uh, some accountant in uh, somewhere in America who... As far as I can see, he doesn't understand accounting. Uh, a, a better story from the players, as I mentioned to you already, was uh, Velvet Underground, who, when I was dr- when we were driving them down all together in the one bus, uh, we were heard them saying, "We're going to a sound check. We've never done that before," because when they first played, there hadn't been PA's as such, um, and they didn't. They had just played with a back line and a vocal mic. So that, that was the last, one of the, the last gigs they ever played. It is, was Nico living in Edinburgh then as well? Uh, no, that was early 80s. She's living just across the road from you, sort of um, uh, with Rab from the Scars getting heavily into junk, I'm afraid. Yeah. That's not the... <laughs> the neighborhood's improved a bit since then. Well, until, <laughs> until I moved in, eh? Um, um, I mean, in terms of the, you know, Scotland as a whole, do you, one of the things that interests me is, you, you know, you, you're putting on shows in Glasgow, you're putting on shows in Edinburgh, you, you put Echo and the Bunnymen out on tour across the Highlands and Islands. Yeah, Whose we, idea was that? Uh, well, they were playing in New York and we put the idea, they wanted to play in Iceland, so we said, let's have a tour of the Northern Hemisphere. So they did um, New York, uh, Iceland, uh, Isle of Sky. Uh, on that tour, and uh, just one day after each other. But we also took uh, Echo and the Bunnymen up round the Highlands with um, four angle poise lights and um, uh, two, two uh, very small uh, speaker stacks and played in little halls all over the Highlands. Uh, we've taken bands like the Water Boys and things up and put circus tents up, put blown down, or we've had to build roads to get onto the site or whatever. Lots of lots of great things. But I think it's really good that there is now local promoters up in the Highlands who are uh, creating, uh, 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 who are claiming their own territory and are making things happen up there. Do you see a difference in terms of the musical taste and the mentality in terms of working with? I mean, how much difference is there working with? you know, 
a promoter in Glasgow to compare to Edinburgh, or Aberdeen, or Inverness. I mean, is there, in fact, is there a difference? Do you, are there certain things, bands, where you're like, there's no way that's going to work um, there? But it, well, that's what be... that's what a promoter gets paid for is knowing the differences in markets and the, and the differences in, in, in who likes what where. Um, and I think that there are subtle subtle differences, uh, and some lots of subtle differences. I mean, country in western works in the west of Scotland that doesn't work many other places. Whatever. And I mean, in terms of the, in terms of the bands that you're you're putting on now in the castle, I mean, is that something where you're focusing focusing a lot of the time, you know, out with unique on the actual castle gigs, or you know, are you choosing the bands? Is that is that your you uh, still sort of keeping well, yeah, the, with the, that? Well, yeah, the, the the problem with the, with the castle is that the overheads are 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 so severe that you you have to have. Uh, Fairly high ticket. You have to have high ticket prices, and so you end up with a lot of um, old age pensioners on the stage as well as in the audience, um, just to be able to charge the 50, 50 60 or even seventy quid that uh, uh, the Rod Stewart's and Leonard Cohen's demand. I mean, when you're paying half a million dollars, uh, was it or was it pounds? I can't remember. Uh, for some of these acts, uh, for eight thousand people, it has to be a high ticket price. And the cost of bribing historic Scotland and the tattoo doesn't help either. Um, but we still like to put some current bands in there, which is why we've got Arcade Fire there, which I think is a, a, a per perfect uh, to, to play an idiosyncratic band with an idiosyncratic venue. 